Hi, thank you for joining us. Welcome to um, In Conversation with Sally Penny and some other people. If you, uh, looks like it's all the regular people who attend this. Um, so it's lovely to see you all. Now, over to you, Kate. Help us get some more sleep and then we can have a discussion afterwards to find out how everyone's week's been going. Oh, okay, thank you. And um, who would like to be this puppy? Yeah, can you see the puppy? Is that coming up all right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's fine. Yeah. Wouldn't we love to be that puppy? Is anyone struggling with sleep at the moment? Yeah. It's so common that um, when our routines are turned upside down, that one of the first things that is suffering is our sleep and our quality of it. Um, but even when times are good, actually, um, our quality of sleep isn't always as we would like it to be. So what I wanted to talk about um with you tonight is um, talk about why we sleep just to it's kind of obvious but it just helps to understand the process of sleep and what's really going on I don't want to bust a couple of myths the eight hour sleep myth is a myth and I hold it up as such I'm going to prove to you why that's um, a complete misnomer and then I would like to give you oh sorry I've gone ahead uh, some tools and habits for better sleep um, there is an introduction slide, but most of you know me, so I'm going to skip that, except to say that I am Kate Thorpe. I'm a therapist and therapeutic coach. I'm grateful for technology today, and I specialize in stress and anxiety related conditions because one, I'm, I know what it's like to live with them, and two, I know that they can be overcome. And when you resolve stress and anxiety, you tend to resolve a lot of other things as well. So that's me in the nutshell. Um, so why do we sleep? what is the purpose of sleep can you type in the chat box what your first thought is when i say why is it that we sleep to recharge emma yeah any others to grow as in physically grow sarah yes. is that what yeah yeah to regain energy regain ourselves and our energy yeah to restore, replenish, and reset, and to, yes, to grow physically, yeah. So there's a lot of reasons there, aren't there? All reasons why we sleep. Here are just um, some of them, a sample of them. Um, we heal when we're asleep. The body heals, the brain heals, as well as recharging. It helps us process life's events. It also helps with uh, memory retention. Have you ever sort of been revising for something the night before and cramming and thinking, gosh, nothing's going in. And then the next morning you wake up and actually there's quite a bit of retention there. Um, that's the power of sleep. It converts short-term memory into long-term memory. Um, it has a multitude of necessities for um, human beings. In fact, for every species on the planet. And actually, you might well notice, but it's worth mentioning that sleep deprivation is actually a form of torture. Um, torture is uh, sadly used far too much and sleep deprivation is um, considered a form of torture. So um, it's pretty serious stuff. Um, you can see I've made a note there about drowsy driving. Has anyone come across that? Drowsy driving. It's um, basically driving when you are sleep deprived. And what happens is you may as well get behind the wheel having a couple of glasses of wine and a shot uh, for all that it does for your physical reactions. So if you're tired, it's really dangerous. You're three times more likely to have a road accident during normal traffic uh, because of the slower reaction times when you are tired. So just having a look at what Nick is saying. Two nights a week without sleep. Gosh, yeah. Wow. That's, that's pretty hardcore, Nikki. Pretty hardcore. So lots of reasons why we sleep. But we don't always sleep as well as we would like. And I wonder if this image resonates with anyone. Yeah. I'm seeing a couple of nods. That sort of 3 a.m. thing. And I wonder if you've done the thing where 3 o'clock and you think... If I go to sleep now, I've got three hours before the alarm clock wakes me up. If I sleep now, I've got two hours. And we're counting down, aren't we? Um, it's so frustrating in the night. And um, it, it, there's all sorts of uh, emotions and thoughts and feelings that are going on. But actually, what I want to do is just reassure you a little bit that actually waking in the night is a perfectly normal and natural thing for human beings to do. And that's because 
there is a myth that says we have to sleep for eight hours. And in our current modern lifestyle, that's kind of what we're geared up to do. But did you know that once upon a time, we didn't sleep this way? You sleep in that sort of underwear, Sally. <laughs> Brilliant. Did you Sorry, know? it was a joke. You said, does anybody recognize the photograph? So I was trying to um, say, yes, that's me. I turn white and I wear white underwear, lingerie, <laughs> looking at the three o'clock. So yeah, sorry. I didn't know you wanted meaningful, I write meaningful comments from now onwards. No, no, no. Keep the jokes coming, Sally. Please do. It lightens the mood. Brilliant. Uh, and I'm just having a moment. So please do. Excuse my very colorful fan. Um, so... Uh, yeah, the myth of the eight hour sleep. Did you know that actually once upon a time, for the vast majority of our time here on Earth, human beings did not sleep in eight hour shifts. We actually had what we call a biphasic uh, sleep. That means that we slept uh, for a few hours, then we woke up, and then um, we went back to sleep for another few hours. So it was called first and second sleep, and it's referred to famously in, in, in certain literature, Dickens novels refers to it. And what happened is that around about the 17th century, um, we started getting a bit of a change because we started getting things like street lights, gas lights, candles, and then electricity came along. And our culture changed so that we had this sort of coffee bar culture that got really popular in the cities and the expensive parts and the rich people who could afford to do this. And that kind of trickled down throughout all of society. Started out in Europe and in London, um, we first got our streetlights in, I think, 1684. Um, and gradually over a period of time, the terminology of sleep changed. So we would have first sleep and then we would wake and people would do, you know, they would read or they would pray or they would have sex or they would um, just ponder their dreams. And then they would go back and have second sleep. But gradually what happened, because we ended up staying up later, the window closed and we moved to a single block of sleep. But many of us still continue to wake in the night. And now we call it insomnia. Now we call it waking in the night insomnia. And um, <coughs> it's all about how we look at it. Many of our cultures are still set up for the biphasic sleep, for the, for the two sleeps. Can anyone think of any? Any spring to mind? REM, we have an REM level of sleep. REM is, is a stage of sleep, yes, but I'm thinking about cultures across the world that actually still sleep largely in two batches. Siesta, Lindsay. Siestas, Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Abs that's right. So many, uh, any country that has um, a siesta culture is generally sleeping in two lots. So it's really quite um, still the norm in the culture set up for it. And an experiment that was done in the 90s um, put people into 14 hours of dark with the rest of the time in the wake. And over a period of time, they reverted back to the two sleep, uh, the two phases of sleep uh, process. So really, it's quite natural for us to wake in the night and it's quite natural for us to sleep in this way. But of course, modern life has uh, dictated that we do it slightly differently. Um, but if you are waking in the night, then it's quite simply the natural way that your body wants to go. So we may have to make some adjustments to take account of that, because, of course, it's no good going to bed at midnight and having to be up for eight in the morning and being awake for two or three hours during the night. So. Um, what you were just saying about the quite like the nursery nap on the rare opportunity absolutely naps are wonderful aren't they naps are gifts of the gods i have to say so the sleep cycle not all sleep is the same we don't just go to sleep and then that's it we actually go through different stages of sleep and forgive me if you know this i'm not going to spend too long on it but rem sleep um who was talking i think it was nikki was talking about rem sleep um that is a stage of sleep where we dream it's a very light stage of sleep but what happens is throughout the night you can see we go down from awake down to relax stage one and two very light sleep deeper and deeper into stages three and four and we stay in stages three and four for about half an hour that is um, where we do the healing bit. That's where the body does its repair, where the brain recharges. Then we come back up into REM sleep and that's where we start dreaming. And even if you don't remember your dreams, you will be dreaming every night because it's a natural part of the process. Then we go back down and we up and so on and so forth. And the cycle repeats until we awake. Each cycle takes about 90 minutes. So if you drop off 
and you sleep for about three or four hours and then you wake up in the night, you've actually had a good two or three rounds. Hilaria, yeah. Wow, so you really have got that cycle going. Um, yeah, if you are waking after three or four hours sleep, then you've already got two or three really good rounds of sleep in. And it's quite common for people to feel refreshed after that time. It's all a very personal thing to know how do I feel. So if you are feeling refreshed, if you are sort of feeling awake, I'm going to share with you some things that you can do to help you get back to sleep in a way that doesn't involve you tossing and turning all night, getting really, really frustrated. But know that if you have only had three or four hours sleep, if you're feeling okay, then you will probably manage quite well until you sleep the next time. Long term, however, that's really bad for us. Long term, it's not a great thing. You feel exhausted but alert. Wow, okay. So there's obviously not enough sleep going on there at all in the first place if, if you're not feeling that way when you wake. Okay. So habits for better sleep. What can we actually do? Well, one of the easiest things that everyone can do is this, is to make the bedroom a sacred space. Okay. Looking at this image of the bedroom, aside from the fact that it's obviously just fresh out of a magazine and the pictures aren't on the walls, what do you notice about it? And they um, obviously have a very good cleaner. Yes, when they can get in with COVID-19, my number one complaint, I know it's first world problems. Um, there is nothing distracting there. Like even the books are tucked away. There's no yeah. radio, laptop. Um, I've noticed on our webinars, a lot of people are calling from bedrooms especially women because that's the one place that you think you can escape to without the children following you um i was thinking actually of having a little corner in our bedroom which is a, a, a place for me to when i record my podcast because it's soft i need softness not a mm -hmm. bathroom which musicians need and um you said kate you know bad idea the bedroom should be sacred so that bedroom is just very empty to allow for sleep there's no distraction Exactly. That's right. Um, Hilary said that's, um, it's a busy bedroom. There's a lot in it. If the stuff were up on the wall, it may look a little better. But um, yeah, there's no clock, Sean. And Sarah, yes, it is calming. And, and Lindsay, the colours are very calming. Nikki, you've never had in your TV in your bedroom, not ever. You get a therapy gold star. Fantastic. That's brilliant. What I really notice about this image is that there's no technology. There's nothing plugged in. There's no TV. There's no radio. And there's no internet. There's no computer. Uh, there's no phone on the side. Um, can't really see a plug socket. And, um, and neither of you, Sarah, you also get a therapy gold star. I'm going to run out at this rate. Um, so keeping a bedroom free from technology as a sacred space, space for two reasons. What do we do in the bedroom? We sleep and we make little people, okay? So keeping our bedroom sacred for those purposes means that we are going to create a mindset that says when we go to our bedroom, we're going to be resting. So yeah, Sally, that's why I'm going to say it's bad to revert to the bedroom with your laptop to do some work, even if it's a corner of the bedroom, because it can interfere with that emotional connection that we have with the bedroom. And just to demonstrate for us, here is a man doing all of the wrong things. And um, what, what's wrong with that? Uh, everyone's, been, everyone's been very shy. I don't know if there's, there is anything wrong with him. Are we judging him or are we judging his bedroom? Or, I mean, I'm judging his beard. He's single. <laughs> Light from the computer. He's looking stressed. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's got a T-shirt on. Well, we couldn't ask him to take it off, really. Um, that might be a little <laughs> bit rude. But um, so, yeah, if you look at his posture for a start, if you imagine standing up with that posture, how comfortable would that be? It would be appalling for your posture. Yes, the light's right in front of his face. The screen is right there. If you look at his hands, the way he's holding himself. Basically, if there is anyone here who does, he develops musculoskeletal issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if we had any physiotherapists here, they can tell us exactly what is um, biologically wrong with this. But 
this is what tends to happen because when we're using technology in the bedroom, then it's, we're not set up for it. So we assume crazy positions. The fact that that light is there right in his face, and he's, he is actually looking pretty stressed, to be fair to him, poor fella. Um, then again, we are creating stress in the bedroom when really we're wanting to be creating a place for calm. And of course, when we do have technology in the bedroom, whether it's TV or anything else, then we end up sort of being constantly plugged in. And even when we are supposed to be resting, then the brain remains plugged in. And it's so difficult to separate ourselves to get to a place where we can rest. Um, TV in the room is exactly the same sort of thing as well. So it's not just about screens and phones and laptops. It's also about TVs. If you're watching Netflix or you're watching the ne next series of something that you're really enjoying and the TV is on, then um, again, you're creating the anticipation of being entertained, of being awake, of being thrilled, perhaps, if it's a, something really exciting that you're watching. So I appreciate lots of us here on this um, on this call are not having TVs in our rooms and that's wonderful to see. But if your kids have TVs in their rooms or um, if people that you know or your partners are being a bit sort of, you know, awkward about shifting that stuff, have a think about how you can make your bedroom sacred. So let's be smart with our technology and think about how we use technology, okay? The first thing really is about being aware of our technology. Um, Last year, Game of Thrones showed its final episode. Did anybody watch it? Raise a hand if you did. Some of us did. Cool. Okay. Did any of you watch it with that in your hand? Uh, Maybe yeah. On... yeah. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. Um, many of us watch TV and we multitask because we're checking Facebook or LinkedIn or, you know, whatever, social media or emails, even worse, work emails. And we multitask. So that is the um, fastest way, particularly in an evening. <gasps> Sorry, I have just been stopped in my tracks by Nikki's chat. She has met Jason Momoa, Aquaman. Oh, my. Well, we're going to have a conversation, Nikki. I'm Who is Jason I'm Momoa? Aquaman. Did you see the film, the superhero? No, I don't watch much television. Oh. Um, I know him. He's, he's a hawk. Oh, my God. He's very pleasant to look at. I'll Google yeah. him afterwards. Mm. He's very, very pleasant to look after. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if that's a criminal offence there, Nikki, is that? Um, he's, <laughs> he's, he's gigantic. Gigantic. Genuinely huge. He's enormous, isn't he? Wow. I would love to Gosh, Kate is literally having hot flashes at the thought of this Jason Momoa. So I've just Googled him. He's a character from Game of Thrones who yes. was one of the warriors, I think. He yes, has he all was. muscles and he's a giant. He is, yes. indeed. Yes. Um, so Game of Thrones aside, <laughs> when we are, um, when we're using technology, we're very often not aware of it. So the first tip really is to really challenge yourself to be aware of how often your phone is in your hand, how often you're checking your technology at night, whether you have technology in the bedroom, um, what your habits are in relation to the bedroom and so on and so forth. So that you can then notice, am I actually using too much technology before bedtime? Because if you are, you are stimulating the brain so many biological and physiological reasons why the brain will associate technology and the use of it with being awake and alert, when really that's the time when we want to be winding down. We want to be preparing ourselves for sleep. It isn't the fact that we bang, we're awake, and then all of a sudden, right, it's bedtime when we're asleep. We have to ease our way into it to allow the body to make the changes it needs to, to get down into those stages of sleep. So be aware of that technology and think about trying to do something different for maybe the last half hour or hour or so before you go to bed, uh, because that will make a difference. Notifications. Um, again, it's how many of us sleep with the phone by the bed? A few of us? Yeah, yeah. Most of us do. I still do. But I have actually now turned it on silent. And I'm pretty well disciplined with it now. But it's taken a long time to train myself. Um, so that is a case of um, do as I say and not as I do. But if you do have the phone by your bed, try removing it um, 
particularly if you check it. If you check Facebook last thing before you go to sleep, you check your emails in the middle of the night just to see if everything's okay because I'll feel better. Or you check emails first thing in the morning. What you're doing is either delaying the time that your brain recognizes you wanting to sleep or you're waking yourself up even more in the middle of the night or in the morning, you're depriving yourself of that time where we naturally wake. And by having the phone right in front of your face, practically as soon as you open your eyes, you're forcing your brain into a state. And it's, it's a bit like a car engine in the morning that's not properly warmed up and it's a bit creaky and cranky and the oil's not going. Um, it's a little bit like that. So I would encourage you to try and change the phone habits, particularly in the morning and in, in, the, in the evening. Um, and turning off notifications is one way of doing that. You've got notifications coming up left, right and centre. It's always, oh, drawn back to the phone, back to the phone. And we become a slave to it, basically. Remove phone and tech from the bedroom. We've already talked about that. And decluttering. If anyone's come across Marie Kondo, I mean, she's the big thing in decluttering. Has anyone done any decluttering? Has anyone actually thought about, um, I'm going to tackle that cupboard, that wardrobe? You badly need to, <laughs> Lindsay. Good. I love that you have no notifications on, Hilaria. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. And what's it like when you declutter? Sally, you're not on mute, so you can speak to us. Oh, right. Sorry, I can't work this bloody headpiece. Um, I attacked the children's playroom which is the room next to the area, you know, the garden area, my corner, they call it now. And it, yesterday, I didn't finish till God knows what time. I missed everything that there was, all my solicitor clients. I mean, it's, it's quite satisfying. And they were like, wow, oh, wow, mummy, we wanted it this time. And it is quite releasing. I don't know. I have an issue about houses looking like hospitals and... Um, clinic so I, I don't like cream everywhere or white <laughs> everywhere um i like homes to feel like homes mm. not houses um but yeah that bloody playroom though was brilliant i took loads of stuff out they haven't noticed yet including <laughs> hundreds of pokemon cards which children collect if you've got mm. nephews and nieces mash attacks and pokemon cards are the devil you'll c come to see this um so it's quite a nice release because you think great um yeah it, it, is, it is nice. I mean, the condo woman, I haven't read a book, but I was spoke to a friend today who is like liberated from doing her. She's just chucked out all her clothes, children's clothes, the whole works. Mm. It's a wonderful feeling. And if you can declutter in the bedroom, then having that extra space and the air that can circulate around you is really, really healthy, as well as being psychologically healthy. Sean only declutters when she's pregnant, so never again. <laughs> fantastic i like that so i'm not suggesting you use this time when we have all of this free time to declutter but sometimes having a look at the bedroom and saying okay how can i how can i make this less can be a really beneficial thing to do and it can really help towards sleep and it might seem like a little thing but little things that build up create big things um so the second tip i want to share with you is making small changes um and I only mean small changes, not, does that mean get rid of husband clothes and husbands? Um, well, if that's your choice, I ain't going to judge. <laughs> um, so we are what we repeatedly do, and it can take a while to develop new habits, but making small changes can be super beneficial. So I'm going to suggest some changes here. Um, divorce lawyers just cried, Sally, but you were joking at that. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to make some suggestions for changes that we can make that can be really simple to make, but I'm not suggesting you do all of them because that would be too overwhelming. Um, maybe pick one or two that might, might shout out to you. Um, there's tons of changes you can make, but here's just a sample. First thing is to create a routine, a routine around bedtime. Um, a routine that delineates the day. Um, in another webinar, I talk about delineating work time and home time, and I might have illustrated that with a story about a person who leaves the house in the morning, walks around the block to enter the house to then start work for the day, and that's their delineation. At the end of the day, they leave the house, walk around the block, and they come back, and then they're home, and that's how they do that. Um, and it's the same thing with 
bedtime. We need to separate bedtime from the rest of the time. And again, really make that break in the mind. Lots of things you can do with that one. Stopping work an hour before bed. Um, we talked about electronic devices. Um, if you're stuck for something to do in an evening that doesn't involve technology, it's a perfect time to think about maybe crafts or hobbies or other things that you do, maybe jigsaws or games uh, that don't involve electronics. Um, we finally managed to get um, a Monopoly game um, in the lockdown because they were like gold dust when lockdown first happened. You could not get them for love nor money. And we got one. So we kind of have an ongoing Monopoly game um that we we sort of you know play for half an hour or so before before going to bed um something that is mentally relaxing maybe you can do a little bit of yoga stretching in the evening some breathing um maybe meditation whatever works for you but some kind of um activity that is restful that you find restorative and that is going to help to relax you and make sure that that's there in the day exercise wonderful thing to do but i'm going to encourage you to do it during the day not in the evening because it produces all the wrong hormones for wanting to rest um, you're all alive and awake after exercise so if you go for your run do it in the morning do it at lunchtime but try and steer away from the evening get as much natural daylight as you can it helps your um it helps your body regulate uh, your mood as well as your um as well as your wake and sleep sleepiness and this is a really helpful tip I found. Um, don't lie awake. So, Hilaria, when you do wake in the middle of the night, do you find that you're tossing and turning and you're struggling? To, yeah, okay. So instead of that, does anyone else resonate with that? I'd be surprised if, if we didn't. I mean, it is a very frustrating time. One thing that you can do, whether you've woken in the night or you're struggling to get off, is actually go, okay, so I'm not sleeping. Get out of bed. Go into a different room and put a soft light on do something calming whether that's reading a book maybe it's helpful to make a list of all the crap that's going around in your brain and put it on a piece of paper so if you wake in the night and you think oh, all these things i've got to do tomorrow make a list you know write them all down then you're not going to forget them if you have thoughts and worries about a situation write about it it's a really great way of channeling and processing those things in a way that's positive and not using technology um, if you just are awake and actually you're not really thinking of anything, maybe do something with your hands. That might involve preparing a meal if you're into food. It might involve uh, drawing or arts or hobbies or something or just listening to music. After a period of time, if you're doing something like that, then the chances are that your natural circadian rhythms will kick in and you will start to feel drowsy again. When you notice that happening, turn everything off, go back to bed, settle down and try again. And if you still find that you're tossing and turning, it's OK to repeat this as many times as you need to. Um, again, the point is to break the cycle of tossing and turning in bed and being frustrated in bed, because then when you go to bed, that's what we're expecting unconsciously. So it's a way of helping yourself to break that cycle. Uh, we've already talked about the bedroom and making it a Zen space, whatever Zen means to you. Um, but really simple things like making the temperature right for you, keeping it dark, especially this time of year as it's getting so light. Um, you know, put some put some blackout curtains up if you need to. Um, keep the windows closed, but make sure that there is some air circulating if you need it. Or if your room is at the front. Um, if you have the space in your home, is it possible to move where your bedroom is so you can have the window open but have it quiet? Um, so sometimes it can involve sort of changes like that um, that, you know, still can be done. And remember the purpose of your bedroom. Two reasons to be in the bedroom, ladies. Things to avoid. Sally, you're not going to like this. Alcoholic nightcap. But I'll tell oh. you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a caveat. I'm going to add a caveat to that. I am having a glass of wine. And I love a glass of wine and more than a glass sometimes. Oh, very good. That's very healthy. Um, in an evening. And that's fine. But if you are struggling to sleep, if you're finding that your sleep is disturbed, that you're waking in the night or you're waking in the morning and you're exhausted, kick the alcohol into touch for a few days and see if that makes a difference. Alcohol has a horrendous impact on the brain and the body when it comes to 
uh, processing it and, and, and so on. So it really does impact the quality of our sleep. And it means that we're not actually getting through all the levels of sleep that we need to, to be healthy. So if you're struggling, try losing the alcohol for a few days and see how that goes and then reintroduce it back in. And if you notice the same thing uh, happening again, then, um, you know, that might be an indicator that perhaps alcohol late at night isn't the best thing. In which case, do your drinking at lunchtime. I say that in jest, of course, ladies. <laughs> so um, the, other, the others are kind of obvious. Don't eat a heavy meal before you go to bed. Avoid caffeine after three. I actually avoid caffeine generally after about um, one o'clock in the afternoon because I get quite sensitive to it. Um, and avoid backlit reading devices as well. Uh, because again, they have the light that comes through. Don't do all of these at once. Maybe just pick one or two. And finally, I appreciate we're coming up on the time and I've already droned on for longer than I intended. So I do apologize, ladies, but I hope it's okay. You're still with me and we're not actually asleep yet. Um, changing your self-talk, how we talk to ourselves has a massive impact. How many times have you woken in the morning and had this kind of approach to the day? What? How many times have we woken in the morning and had this kind of approach to the day? Oh, I'm so tired. It's going to be a long day. And that may be true. Absolutely. But ask yourself, am I actually tired or am I just really peed off that I didn't get my full eight hours of sleep last night? Actually assess how you are feeling in your body. Ask your body, how are you feeling? Are you feeling awake or are you feeling shattered? If you're feeling awake, um, then it's helpful to begin to shift that mindset that says, I've had no sleep, therefore I am going to be tired because that's not always the case. We do get a second wind. Self-talk determines the mood. Whereas if we can try and set a different mood with the self-talk to say to ourselves, well, okay, I might not be as springy and as bouncy as that puppy, but I'm awake. I am here, I am present, I can take care of myself, I can, can take control and I can make some changes that mean nights like last night aren't going to be the norm going forward, then we can just reframe things a little bit. Um, there's a lot more I could say about that, but I won't, I will move on. A lot of objections um, I hear are from people who say, I'm too busy to make changes, I can't possibly change my day and maneuver my kids around and maneuver the family arrangements around so that I can perhaps go to bed earlier and wake up later. My job won't allow it and so on and so forth. Well, that may be true. But what I would say to you is that if your life is too busy for you to make any changes and so that you can't give yourself some more time, even if that's just half an hour, then I'm going to say it straight. Your life is too busy and unsustainable. And that's not going to be great for long-term mental health, let alone sleep. When we think laterally, there are ways that we can make small tweaks, whether that's asking for help from other people, whether it's getting a bit of different cooperation from the kids if we're a single mum, whether it's having a negotiation with our partners or, or whoever is around. Um, there are ways of doing it. But please don't let the I'm too busy mindset impact on your abilities to say i can make changes because when we course correct when we can steer around obstacles then we can end up having a much much smoother ride remember that sleep deprivation in the long term adds up to so many horrible horrible things that with a few tweaks we could change we can reverse that making small changes add up they have a ripple effect which means that the more changes you make, the bigger the impact, not just on yourself, but on the people around you. If you're feeling more rested, if you are taking more time for yourself in the evening to change your routine, maybe decluttering the bedroom, maybe stopping with the notifications on the phone and anything else, um, making no small changes can really ripple out to have a much greater effect. It's not about making massive changes and seeing a massive change straight away. It's about building up slowly. So there are choices and you have a choice after this evening. 
one of the choices is to do nothing. Do nothing different. Go, oh, it was a bit interesting. That was okay. Well, I hope you would say it was a bit interesting. But I'm not going to do anything different because actually it really doesn't apply to me. And if that's the case, then nothing will change. And if you want it to, maybe not the choice you want to make. But if you change just one thing, just one thing, then the possibilities of that ripple effect can become infinite. So I would encourage you that if you are struggling with sleep, make one change, just one, and see what happens. A very shameless plug. I'm creating a sleep program. It's going to be called Sleep Well for Life, and it's going to be out um, in the next few weeks. Apologies, that's the end of my plug. If you are interested, please speak to me about it. But if there are any questions, I would love to hear them. I hope that's Brilliant. been okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was fantastic. Let's do our virtual clap. Uh, that was really good and really interesting. And I think there was at least one takeaway for everybody.